Ali, welcome to the show. Justin, it's a pleasure, man. Thank you for having me. Of course. So I've been listening to your stuff for a little while now, and I have to say, when it comes to learning languages, you're probably my top two go-to guy. What do you wow. think about that? I think that's I think that's awesome. Um, <laughs> although, of course, I have to say, there's many others who are just as just as pro- just as smart and probably smarter than me. But I, I'll take the I'll mm. take the compliment. Thank you very much. Well, as far as learning languages, though, like you have a very dialed-in approach for people that I think, for most people that go into learning a language specifically, it's the beginning stages are the hardest part, right? Well, once you become AKA a polyglot and you have your own system uh, and we can get into everyone has their own system, but it's the beginning stages where people typically like to quit and where they get frustrated and, or they'll jump around like I'm learning German, but German's not catching on. So now I'm going to go into learn uh, Tagala or I'm going to learn, you know, a completely different language. And there's this jumping around effect that people do because they feel like they're not making progress and then they start to resent the language. And I feel the beginning stages are the most crucial part because once you're in the intermediate, you get some traction. It's like starting a business to me is in the beginning stages, you're shelling out money, you're shelling out, you're selling out more money. You have all this capital. Now you're in debt and now you have to make up this money. You're putting all this pressure on yourself Versus when you're rolling and you're making six figures a month consistently on a systematic basis, well, now you have that momentum. You're not making a million dollars a month, but you're making six figures. Now it's like, wow, how do we get to a million? I, I feel that's the same psychological concept with language learning. So, yeah, it, it's it, languages is funny because every stage brings its own challenges. I mean, a bit like business, it's kind of the same. Um, and you've got you've you've got typical points where people tend to get stuck with languages. So you've got the kind of most people never get beyond the zero beginner phase, um, and then for the people that do, you know, you've got this kind of honeymoon period, as I like to call it, of the first sort of three to six months. And then um, when you get to the intermediate stage, you're like, then you can really start talking and you can understand people. But then you get stuck at this thing called the intermediate plateau, which is then really hard to break through, and then you kind of get to more advanced stages and you know you're really think you're really competent at the language but then you can be in certain situations and still be totally lost so the goalposts do keep moving but what's for sure uh is that um the the, the polyglot thing as you as you describe it i i, I don't like i don't like to use that term so much because it kind of p- puts creates a kind of halo effect a bit of a pedestal situation um but when people when you've learned a lot of languages in the past it creates this effect whereby you you kind of know what the roadmap is so you don't get phased so easily and that helps in in just showing up every day doing the work Mm -hmm. and ultimately getting results right and so first off just so people know i want you to say how, how much how many languages does ali richard speak so there's the there's the simple answer and there is the the complicated answer. Hmm. Benny Lewis had the same idea. had the same response. He said, oh, really? "Well, it, he I, well, okay, so he identified me being fluent in a language is if I can do engineering in French or engineering in Japanese." I was like, "Okay, I I understand what you're saying, Benny, but like if you can have an if you can go to France, have a normal conversation about anything, not most people that speak English can't do don't don't understand electrical and mechanical engineering terminology, right? But if you can have a normal conversation, you're pretty much fluent in this space. So everyone does have a different definition on yeah. how they identify fluency. So my 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 definition of fluency for like for my purposes is I call it the pub test. And the pub test is this: if we can go to a pub, I'm in the UK, so we talk talk pubs over here, but we can call yep. it the bar test if you want. If we can go to the pub, have a drink. And enjoy the conversation, like mm-hmm. genuinely enjoy it without having to kind of pander to the other person too much. That is that that for me is a kind of sign of like social fluency, conversational fluency, and that's where I always kind of aim at um, with my with my languages. And, and I have eight languages to that level, um, and then some are on the lower end, uh, a few on the higher end. Um, but what's also interesting is it changes over time, right? Because um, so a lot of my languages I learned in my twenties. And I got to a really good level. Like you go on my YouTube channel, at, um, Ollie Richards uh, on YouTube, you can see videos of me speaking like really kind of fluent Italian and uh, and Arabic and stuff uh, in years gone by. But, you know, since 
moving back to the UK, having a family, uh, mm. starting a business. I literally haven't spoken these languages for five or six years, right? So it creates this interesting effect whereby, like, I used to speak these languages really well, and I could probably get them back, but like, you know, if if, if you pin me down, it's it's it can be tricky. So it, it's a really interesting. Um, it's interesting how that changes over time. Right. But you have muscle memory, though. I mean... Or should I say mental memory, right? Like, if you so play a sport I, and you're a football player, the first 10 minutes, you might be a little rusty. But over t after a while, it's like riding a bike. I think there is that. It, it's. I don't know how to what extent that analogy works. But what's for sure is you never forget. You never lose the language. I think mm -hmm. what what can happen is that you can it, can it can drift out of your immediate memory, so like that's what we call like super rusty. So like you can even forget basic words sometimes, but usually within within a couple of weeks, if you ha even if you haven't spoken a language for 10, 20 years, within a couple of weeks of study, you can get it back pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So um, so you you it's always there, and it's but it's it's not necessarily immediately accessible. Right. What was the first language that you learned that you were successful with? So my first, so the first language I was successful with was French, which I learned when I was 19 years old. And um, it's kind of an interesting story because I was, I just started uni in, uh, in London. And I, I so I did a, a degree in jazz, jazz piano. That was my thing. And, um, and I, and I, and I completed my first year and um, I, Decided to take a year out, which was kind of crazy. I, I basically had in my mind, if I just take a year out and just spend the whole year practicing piano, I'll be like the best in the world. And then everyone will want to <laughs> book me for their, for their gigs and stuff. But then right at the beginning of that year, my girlfriend at the time, my girlfriend of two years, uh, decided to break up with me, which sent me into this massive spin. And you know what it's like when you're 19 and this stuff happens. It, it just knocks you for six. So um, I was in a bad place, didn't want to play music or anything. And so I took a job in a local cafe. And in this cafe, there were a whole bunch of um, people from different places. Uh, there was people, someone from Sweden, from Italy, from Japan. Mm. And they, they, not only did they all speak English, but they also spoke each other's languages a lot of the time. And I remember thinking, man, I feel dumb as hell. This like the one monolingual British guy here. And I sort of vowed in that moment, right, I'm going to learn to speak in their, in their languages. So I started learning French. And then a couple of months later, I actually got a one-way ticket to Paris. So I moved to Paris one way, like lived in a youth hostel, ended up blagging my way into a job there. And I was like working there in Paris for about six months. And I didn't really speak much French at the time, but I was so stubborn and so determined that I just kind of blagged my way into this job and then kind of learned French on the job. Uh, and, um, and yeah, at the end of six months, I was pretty good. Mm, interesting. So you said you were pretty good and you learned on the job. So I, I used to work a long time ago, about a decade ago. I worked in LA at different, you know, different odd jobs. I worked at a collision car center. I worked at all these random jobs. I was a boxing trainer in Santa Monica and I worked with a lot of different people. I worked with people from Iran that spoke Farsi. I spoke, I talked to a lot of Russian people and I was around that for about a year or two. I learned maybe three words and I was really trying to. So when you say that you kind of understood it in six months, hmm. what was your process? Like, what do you think, like looking back at it, at it in hindsight that you can pinpoint, wow, this actually was the, you know, the game changer moment and, you know, yeah. kind of like the four hour work week you know, deal it, it, when it comes to elimination, what actually works and then eliminate everything that doesn't work. Sure. What was that point at that stage for you specifically? Obviously that might've changed now because you have a whole program. Yeah, it has changed a lot over the years for sure. And, but just to be clear, like after six months, I was pretty fluent. You know, I had a, had a, had a French girlfriend. I was uh, wow. like, my whole social life was in French. That's, that's really impressive. Um, yeah. I mean, well that, that, so that was what gave me the confidence to then go on and say like, okay, I think I can learn more of these languages. So if I had to really distill it, then um, first thing to say is I did a couple of years at French at school. So it wasn't mm. totally new for me. But you know what languages at school are like. You know, you, no one wants to be right. there. You don't learn much. But I did have some foundation. You know, I, I knew how to say um, where's the train station or like, or uh, you know, two, uh, a, 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 like a double room for two nights, please. Like, that, you know, that kind of uh, tourist language. Um, so 
Number first thing is I would study like crazy, right? So I would get a textbook and I would sit in the um, in the downtime during my job at the hotel and I would just plow through this textbook. So I was studying the thing every day. And, you know, whatever you think about textbooks, if you're spending two hours a day on it, you're going to learn stuff, right? So that's number one. Number two, uh, I was in France. So I was surrounded by the French language every day. Now that doesn't always make it, that doesn't mean it's like e that it's easy to practice speaking with people because in, in, in practice, a lot of the time living in another country is actually still quite hard to practice speaking with people because they don't want to, people don't want to take time out of their day to babysit you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I was listening to French on the street all the time. The third thing that I did that was really, really impactful was I found a language exchange partner. And uh, I found him totally by accident. I was working at this um, in this youth hostel where I worked and I was sitting at the reception desk and this guy walked past the open window one day and kind of um, walked past and looked at me and then kind of, you know, did a double take and then came into the, in, into the, inside the youth hostel and said, came up to me and said, are, are you, um, where are you from? I said, well, I'm from, I'm from England. I said, okay, that's cool. Cause I'm learning, I'm learning English. Are you learning French? And I said, well, yeah, I am actually. And so he says, you know, do you want to maybe meet and help each other practice? Um, we could meet up and then spend an hour in French and an hour in English. And I said, yeah, that sounds like a cool idea. Uh, later, I discovered that that was called a language exchange or a tandem, as I think you guys call it uh, in the US. Mm -hmm. And um, and so me and Luca, his name was, we would meet like two or three times a week and spend an hour in English and an hour in French. So every question I had, I would ask him. Um, and he was a really good teacher as well, like, uh, you know, just um, just casually. And, and so what that meant was I had a very safe environment to practice with, to practice in. So I could sit down and spend an hour speaking French without worrying about looking stupid. And he would correct me and he would tell me a better way to say things. And so um, it was those, those three things, really. It was number one, it was the study. It, number two, it was the, the immersion environment. And then number three, it was the, oppor the opportunity to practice with a safe person. Mm. Uh, meant, meant that then I kind of got on this flywheel, uh, to use a business term, and um, kept it up over over a period of months. And then that's where the progress really comes from. Right. Would you say that now, because your approach now is much different, that, that the way you learned French initially isn't the most optimal program to learn a foreign language i see i don't i don't believe in the optimal program um to be honest i think i think it's easy to well there's definitely ways to... right there's definitely different ways like if you're on duolingo learning you know even an hour a day on duolingo i'm sure some people have become fluent i'm sure it's possible but it's very drastic versus what you're doing with reading or learning through stories or what matt versus japan is doing with refold in full immersion and and then wang and all the other things i think as far as like actually learning you guys those top three i would say you matt versus japan so refold your program and also wang i feel like they have the highest success rate versus you just going on rosetta stone or Babel. um so you know, yeah. it, it, that's what people want to hear. They want to say, okay, what is, is definitely a waste of time and what definitely works? And, you know, the, the, I resist this because, because the problem is that we, I, I can, so I can talk in general terms about what, about what works. Right. And me mm -hmm. and Matt and the other one, I'm, like, I'm not familiar, not familiar with that. Yeah. Um, but, um, but see, if you look at successful language, then as you, you will see certain things in common and, and we can, we can, I can tell you what those things are. We can, we can talk about what those things are. Um, but I resist talking about the best approach or this approach to kind of like that distilling language learning down into its core, core parts because none of us function in a purely rational way. We're not robots in the way that we learn. So even though we can talk in terms of like the best, um, you know, let's just say that, there was such a thing as the perfect language learning method. And I told you what that is. You wouldn't be able to execute on that thing for a variety of reasons, like either because you're too busy or you don't have the right character or I'm not saying you personally, Justin, right. though, but you know what Sorry. I mean? Or, <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. or else you don't have the, you don't have access to the right environment. Um, you know, for example, the, the single, the, you want to know what the single one best 
language learning method in the world is full immersion in country. So you go to the country, you live with the host family, uh, you go to school mm -hmm. in the in in the language. Um, don't speak a word of of English ever again. You'll be fluent within a year. Yeah. And yet, uh, yeah, hundred percent. Mm, I heard. And, I've heard that it's. Well, there was a couple guys that are on that are in the polyglot world, and they said that even though you go to a different language, go to a different country, and have to speak a completely different language, it doesn't really help you as much because it's extremely frustrating. Um, that you're trying to listen hard, but you're also not listening 100% of the time because you're thinking about what to say next. Like, you ever meet some of those guys where you know they're really not listening to you? They're just waiting for you to stop talking so they can say what they want? I feel like okay, that's kind of how... Okay, go ahead. There's a difference. The conditions are important. So just going to a foreign country is not enough by far. In fact, you, so if I learn a new language these days, I don't. even if I could go and live in the country, I don't because it's more effective to... At the beginning, you just need to study time by yourself, right? You need to just acquire the basics of the language. What I said before was very, very specific. Full immersion, meaning that you stay with a host family. So you have to coexist with people who, who speak that language and don't speak English. So if you want to eat or if you need anything, you've got to use the language, mm -hmm. right? You go to school, meaning that you're in a place where you... Um, you have to study, you have to turn up, you have to interact with people, you've got no choice. The information gap there um, dictates that you have to use the language to get the stuff that you want, right? If you just go and do what I did in Japan, for example, you just go to the country, get a job, um, most likely speaking English, you won't learn anything. It's because you, you're, in, you're basically in the same situation as you were back home, so you've still got to study. Right? Gotcha. So the, the point I was making was that if you can surround yourself genuinely 24 7 in the language and a need to use it then you will learn you'll be fluent within a year no question however no one can do it because there are just all these practical steps ahead right and so sure. trickling down from that is every every variation under the sun of, of of language learning methods so for example you mentioned matt versus japan um mm. phenomenal speaker of japanese what he did was he basically locked himself in his bedroom and um, I'm, I'm caricaturing his. So forgive me, Matt, if you're listening, but you know, um, <laughs> it's like he basically locked himself away for the best part of five years and did nothing but read and listen to Japanese. Hmm. Super effective, almost impossible to do. So in choosing your methods, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to find that thing that works for you. You've got to find that intersection between eff efficacy and feasibility. And then, and then just like, and then double down on, on, on that thing there. Hmm. So you, I know it's, I know it's a difficult pill to swallow, but th I, I really believe that's the truth. Gotcha. No, the listeners definitely will take that for sure. That's very helpful. When you talk about immersion, right. And we brought up Matt versus Japan. I think if anyone's listening that doesn't know who Matt versus Japan is, uh, he has a company, I think he's a co-founder of a company called refold and, it's a little bit more complex than what I'm going to explain it as, but basically it's a full immersion term where they lay out the blueprint of you learning a specific language and your targeted language. And it's laid out where it's full immersion. So for instance, he learned Japanese by watching Japanese anime. If you're really into Japanese anime and you love Japanese culture, you might want to check out refold. But even if you like Spanish, it's the same thing. It's the same process, same tactics, obviously different content because it's different language. So this is this is an issue that a lot of people have when it comes to full immersion. And obviously, you have to have a good mindset of not getting frustrated and accept the fact that you're not going to really understand what's going on for a while if you use the Matt versus Japan refold method. Your approach is reading with stories, right? So one, why when someone is first starting off, they should they should learn with reading through short stories versus just watch 3,000 hours of Beast Slayer? Or Demon Slayer, whatever the show is, I'm not fully uh, fully educated on Japanese anime. Is there, a, is there a number two, or is it is it just that question? No, that's it. Oh, because you, you started with one, so I thought there was a two coming. Oh no, um, yeah, basically because you you emphasize reading through short stories, which I think yeah. is actually really good. I have a question about that, but yeah, okay, so okay. so to give the to give context, so I I teach with a method I call story learning. Uh, mm -hmm. And and the idea here is that you learn through stories. Now, um, stories in themselves, 
is kind of on the same continuum as any other immersion-based method, right? So whereas, whereas um, Matt might talk about, for example, learning through TV, um, someone else might talk about learning through, um, I don't know, um, uh, podcasts. Mm. For me, it's stories. And when I'm talking about stories, I'm talking specifically about reading and listening to those stories. You're reading a book and you're listening to the audio. So in in the as a starting point, all the things I just mentioned are basically the same general approach to language learning, which is an input-based approach, what we call it. So the idea is rather than studying grammar rules and memorizing lists of words like you did at school, instead you get input in the language, so you're reading and listening, and that is the better way round to do it because you end up getting a complete view of the language right? rather than the kind of uh, bite-sized McNugget approach to, to, to studying like we do traditionally. So that's the first thing to say. Now, why stories in particular? So my belief is that if you take the approach of, okay, we want to learn through immersion. Yes, great, tick. Um, but that our approach to language learning is going to be right. Let's just go and listen to 5,000 hours of Japanese. Now, in from my perspective as a teacher, and I have a long, um, long background of uh, of teaching languages as well, which uh, is another topic. But from my perspective, this is where it falls down when the rubber hits the road, right? Because most people are simply not going to sit and listen to five thousand hours of the, of, of the language, even if I told you Look, this is the best way. You won't do it. You'll get bored. You'll get distracted. You'll get frustrated. So my methods are focused very much on how does this work in the real world. I want you to get all the main benefits of immersion, but I want you to actually be able to do it and follow mm. through and stay motivated because I think that ultimately I'm going to be able to help the most people that way than if I turn up and say, hey, I've got the, the like the clinically, scientifically proved best method, but then right. no one can actually follow through. Can I, can I stop you real quick? Can I stop sure. you real quick? So you said no one has time to listen to 5,000 hours of Japanese. Yeah. But even if you listen to 5,000 hours of Japanese and you're in a, there's no English subtitles and you don't know what the hell is going on, you've never learned one word in Japanese, I feel like you're just hearing noise. I feel like that's not maybe 30,000 hours of Japanese you'll start putting stuff together. But I don't, I don't think 5,000 hours is enough if you don't understand what's going on. You're just reading kanjis. So... Um... My view is that if you spend long enough doing anything, you will learn it. And mm. I think there's there's a there's a there's a slight kind of a, se a sequencing issue here, right? Because because I don't think anyone would suggest that if you come to Japanese on day one, then the first thing you should do is just watch movies for for twelve hours a day. You know, you you can you can go through a textbook for the, for your first month or whatever just to get your just to get the basics. All right. So I mean, I mean, I think that, but but that's like that's a drop in the ocean. But it's just a way to get a way to get started. The principle here is that one. Let's let's assume you learn the basics. Then the question you're asking is, can you actually learn by just listening to ten thousand hours of Japanese? And my my answer is yes, you can. If a you actually do listen to ten thousand hours, which in reality no one ever will. Right. And B, you actively listen, and this is the this is the, this is the key, right? You can't just have it on in the background whilst you're doing the dishes. You actually have to focus because part of learning through immersion involves uh, actually focusing heavily on the thing that you're listening to. Not all the time. Not like not like even if you barely understand anything, even if you understand one word out of three hundred. At first, yeah, but the thing is, if you're say watching movies, um, or reading anime, then what you will find over time is that you start to put together the patterns and you start mm. to say, okay, there's that word again. Uh, and then given enough repetitions, you start to see that because any language, most languages actually have a, a very small number of core vocabulary. So, you know, the, 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 the stat that's often used is there are, um, you know, 100 words in English account for 50% of all the words you'll ever hear in the language. Words like right. and and the and mm -hmm. go and have, right? So just by brute repetition, you will start to to do it. All right. So I think the theory is sound, just in, in exactly the same way as we could say, yeah, interstellar travel. We know how it would work in theory, but like we're not, but you know, it's not yeah. going to happen. 
And so to, 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 so then to, to kind of work backwards from there, my approach is to say, okay, I want you to get the benefits of um, full immersion from the beginning. So what I do is I create very simple stories in the language um, and, and, I, and I have you read and listen to those stories from day one. Oh, listen and to it's audiobook. Yeah. Oh, wow. So it's the, it's both, it's both, it's the text and the audio. Why? Because mm. reading is the more convenient way to study, but listening, because I want you to get used to hearing the sounds of the language because you want to be able to understand people as well. Right. So mm -hmm. it comes together. So on, so on day one, I will have you reading and listening to a very simple story um, in the language. And then your next question is, but how do you understand anything? on day one? The answer is, I get you to spend time with the language, read and listen to that, say the first chapter of a story. And then I come in with a lesson and I help you kind of uncover what you've just listened to. Mm -hmm. So I kind of come in with, with some tuition at the beginning because my belief is if I can get, if I can just teach you a few key things along with everything that you're consuming, then your intellectual consciousness will be able to move a lot faster at the beginning. It will get you moving. Um, and then so I, so I combine very simple stories, which is kind of my version of immersion, along with a little bit of tuition, which just starts to create mm. this snowball effect. Yeah. And then you keep that up, and then, then you just start to kind of scale up from there. And my ultimate aim is to get you to the point where you can read and listen to anything without any explanations at all. Yeah, I didn't know that you had an audiobook component of it. I thought it was just reading, which, you know, then you can get into the pronun pronunciation and hearing the languages. Because yeah, exactly. I can because I can look at, I have about, I don't know, almost a thousand flashcards of Spanish and almost a thousand flashcards of German. And mm -hmm. I can go through that and I can read it. And I might even know that this word means sun or this word means desk, but I, it might sound completely different. And that's going to screw me up moving forward. Yeah. So my critique of this of that approach that you've just described there is that it fits neatly into the what you described earlier as the kind of you know the, the eighty twentyfication of yeah. uh, of language learning, right? And yes, you can learn the most important stuff at the, at the beginning and 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 then shortcut um, to a certain extent. But the the amount that you're shortcutting is the first zero point five percent of the journey. <laughs> so what's left ahead of you is like the rest of the language right mm -hmm. and so what happens is um uh, i i think you know you, that the approach you're describing could could be great potentially for the first 100 200 words just to get you just to get you going mm -hmm. but once you get beyond that what you find is that stuff can't be words in a language can't be neatly distilled onto a flashcard mm. right so the word bear in english um think of all the different meanings of the word bear it can be the animal it can mean mm -hmm. naked it can mean uh, carrying or giving it can mm -hmm. mean having carrying a child right um so there are many words like that word in other languages which have multiple meanings and multiple nuances as well you know what's the difference between great fantastic wonderful excellent awesome really right. like, how would you ever describe like english that? speakers they forget that they th when yeah. they learn a new language, they're like, wow, Spanish, one word has six different meanings in Japanese, depend or not Jap well, I guess Japanese, I'm not that educated in Japanese uh, language learning, but with Mandarin, it's like, oh, this one word has nine different sounds, and it means completely different things. Well, did you forget that English is the same way, but you're just used to it? And then when you yeah. start to think about it, like, wow, two has three different words, and it's two. And they're like, oh, wow, depending on how I use two in a sentence dictates what that two specifically means. There you go. And so my why do people forget uh, that? Because we're not educated in in in, in languages. It's, it's we're something we we never we never we never know consciously, right? So if you follow that through to its logical conclusion, then you realize that uh, it doesn't do you much good to memorize snippets of information you're far better off spending your time with what's called the whole language. So rather than one word on a flashcard, an yes. entire book, because even though you're not going to be able to memorize everything in that book, every hour that you, every minute that you spend with that book, you're getting exposure to the whole language, the grammar, the vocabulary, mm. the culture, the ways of speaking. And so um, 
it's the it's the difference between um, what you call an, an atomistic approach and a holistic approach. Right? So the atomistic approach is what uh, what you described there with the with the flashcards, focusing on the part, versus the holistic approach, focusing on the whole. Saying if we just spend enough time in the company of the language, then eventually, however fast or slow we learn, we will emerge on the other side with a complete, genuine, authentic view of everything that that, that the language is. Mm. Right, um, and so. Yeah, that's 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 the theory. No, for sure. I think your approach is the best for like fresh beginners. I think in order to do the refold method to the you know ten out of ten max out every vector, you have to be committed and obsessed. And I think on a scalability factor, it's going to be really difficult for that for people to hold on to that because when it comes to the yeah. full immersion, watching you know let's say for instance, Narcos in Spanish, you're going to have to watch Narcos multiple times. And then you might not see any progress, even though you are technically making project uh, progress in your mind, you're not going to see the results like going to the gym. Oh, my, my biceps or my deltoids are getting bigger. This is great. Let's go back to the gym because if I do more, my deltoids will get bigger and I'll look great. I'll feel good about myself and my ego will be inflated and I'll feel like Superman, right? You have these results that are hardwired into our human psychology to do things, get a result, do things, get a result. And that's why human civilization is amazing because those things are hardwired into our DNA. But when it comes to that full immersion, watching 3000 hours of Japanese anime, you get no result. You're going to get, most people are going to give up unless you're a diehard. It's, it's, I mean, and the reason that people approach languages like that, like that is because most other things in our education system can be broken down, right? So, so for example, nutrition, you can break it down to the calorie, you can break down to the calories, to the macros, to the the exercises you do in the gym every day, and you know, um, hey, if I just consume this number of calories, then I will biologically have to lose weight. Uh, and you can actually see that from uh, on almost a daily basis, certainly on a weekly basis. If you study um, geography or or maths or um, you know engineering, the there are very specific items of information that have a practical use right when you know how to add or subtract or divide then it's it's a you know one in one out you learn something you can do something with it straight away <laughs> and so i think people like people have a fantasy that language learning can be like that but it's not man it's just not it's like learning music you know you you can learn to, to read all the notes on the score but that doesn't mean you can play with any feeling and 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 i think mu language is, is a, are a lot more like music where so an, an, an analogy I use sometimes is imagine that you learn to play the guitar uh, from music, right? Imagine you learn to read, uh, to read music and to play the guitar, but you never, ever listened to any guitar music. What would you play like? It whatever you, however you played, it wouldn't sound like it should sound, right? You wouldn't have any, it wouldn't sound like, because you, you would have to have no idea what it's supposed right. to sound like. Exactly. And so where, where we get, where we come unstuck, where people come unstuck with languages is like, we don't know as humans how to deal with these longer term processes where we can't measure the progress from one day to the next. And it screws with us, messes with our heads. Um, and so we're kind of, people go on this endless quest of like, you know, how can we, if I just memorize these 10 flash, these 500 right. flashcards, then I'll right, be, right. But, but the, just, how do we hack the system? Yeah. How do you hack the system? And it's like, I think <laughs> the secret really is to go, like do a 180 and yeah. go the other way language hacker 101 well that's a good point and for people that maybe are using the fully immersion method with netflix or whatever japanese anime just as an example and they're not seeing any progress because you're not going to in the first couple months real at least real progress um what would you tell that person to stay on the horse if they're thinking about if they're thinking about what uh, giving up or deeming it a waste of time so i think if, if someone's on a full immersion path it's kind of back to that thing of like hey you're doing the best possible thing but the minute you start to doubt it and give up you it's it, like it's over that is over and so that approach there are people i know people that do that approach and they can mm. stick to it for like three years like eight hours a day like so it works but most of us aren't like that so i i would say look um That old, you know, that old cliche about it's the journey, not the destination. Exactly. I mean, as far as possible, try to bear that in mind because, <laughs> because you know, there is no destination. 
You never right. get to a point like pick the best language learner you know who speaks the most languages the most fluently. If you think that they're satisfied, that that like, job done for them, it's not. It never is. There's always that word you don't know. There's always that situation you can't navigate. So you know, ultimately, and you know, I think this is this is definitely a view that I've come to have more with with age. But I, I just think that you know, man, it, just you just got to enjoy it. Do what yeah. you enjoy because um, you've only got one life, and so you bet you may as well enjoy it. And there's a fairly high chance that if you're enjoying yourself, you will learn more because those two things are closely connected. Well, yeah, and to piggyback on that is don't put so much pressure on yourself because you said it perfect. Life is too short, and you could spend 15 years perfecting your Chinese, your Mandarin, or your Cantonese, or your Japanese, and then 15 years, boom, let's say you start learning at 30, now you're 45, and now you can enjoy speaking the language, or now you can feel happy, which you're not going to feel happy, because then there's going to be another issue that pops up. It's a good point. How do people rewire their mind to enjoy the journey versus just wanting results? I mean, so this is the thing that kind of thing that people spend thousands of dollars on therapy for in more mainstream areas of their life, right? How do you learn to, yep. how do you, how do you learn to chill? How do you learn to um, let go of, uh, you know, relinquish your high standards, your high expectations of yourself? Um, you know, I, I expect that people like you and I, um, people like you and me, I should say, um, are, <laughs> It's okay. Sorry. You're not. You're, you're over there. You're over there. We're, we're occupational, <laughs> occupational hazards with the language teaching. Uh, people like you and me, um, we are pretty driven, high achieving type people, and um, I suspect that you approach language learning like your business, like everything else that you like your fitness, like everything else you do, right? Yep. And um, A I, analytical much... and analytical, rip it rip it down to the bare roots yep yeah so i'm I, I'm, so I'm very much the same and um I, the, the, you know the answer i want to give to this question is the, is, <laughs> is, is, is um it's going to take us down a very different path All which right. is not going to help anyone with their language learning i don't think but but um <laughs> but i think i think you can't avoid you can't avoid um the the the, the sort of the philosophical avenues here i mean i, I really think that what what really helped me in a lot of different areas was um, when I when I discovered um, Buddhism and Buddhist thought, and the in particular the idea of uh, not being attached to outcomes. That changed my uh, I want to swear, but that changed my world, man. I mean, because yeah. I just I just I just started looking at all these areas of my life where I'm like, hang on a minute, I'm so attached to this outcome that I will be fluent in Japanese. And I, and I never stopped to think whether that outcome is actually something that matters to me or not. And yet I'm letting it govern my day to day. I'm letting it govern my psychology on a day to day. I'm beating myself, myself up on a daily basis because I'm not, I haven't yet achieved that thing. And if you're not careful, that can take over your whole life. And, um, you know, I personally, because of this ten these tendencies that I have, I've had to do a lot of work on, um, on, on just letting go of attachments and, being mm. being able to appreciate and enjoy the moment and um and i think there's a few few things that can help in this area there's there's i mean buddhism is obviously not for everyone but it's but it's interesting very interesting there's mindfulness as a whole discipline which is life-changing for a lot of people mindfulness meditation um there's a great book that was doing the rounds recently you've probably heard of it called four thousand weeks by oliver berkman British guy, yep. um, very popular book. Uh, and he, so he kind of comes from the background of, um, of productivity. He was a productivity guru <laughs> and then wrote this book on productivity, which is actually kind of a manual for life. And it, and it kind of gets you to this conclusion where when you, as soon as you start to accept that nothing we do ever matters and that we're all going to die and we're all going to be forgotten, um, then, you kind of you 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 get you end up at the conclusion that hey man I may as well enjoy myself and I may as well enjoy the process. So you know if you if you buy in if you buy what I'm saying here, which you know you don't have to, but 
if, if I, I completely sense. buy into what you're saying. I, I'm yeah. conflicted, man, because my whole life is based on how to become Bradley Cooper and Limitless and then also <laughs> seeing the big picture. <laughs> so yeah, that's it. It goes it. it goes back and forth. I'm a very I'm typical American when it comes to business, but but my, my my morals and my ethics and my big vision is very is very different than American culture for sure. Um, like, have you ever heard? You've heard of Sad Guru, right? No. He was he was actually just on Rogan. He's coming on the show. Huge. He's you know typical yogi guy, but brilliant. And uh, because you brought up Buddhism, obviously it's different. He's a yogi, but brilliant insight, wisdom, and and even stuff talking about neuroscience, which you know typically you look at. You know, some guy in a lab coat talking about neuroscience. This guy is a yogi sitting in the woods, but brilliant knows ev mostly everything you really need to know. He might not know how to build rockets, but he understands everything that you're speaking of. And I think that would be a good place, not only for you to go, but also the listeners to go as well. Sad Guru. Shout out to Sad Guru. Yeah. So, so I mean, I'm, it's funnily enough, when I started getting into this world, I also had to fight back the temptation to kind of start to learn everything about it because I, I was almost kind of applying that 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 need yes. for kind of achievement to okay, I've got to discover this new thing and learn everything. <laughs> I was like, no, hang on, man, I'm there. I'm just doing it again in a yep. different area. So um, I, I, I'm I'm not at all across the science of of, of all of this stuff. Um, I'm it's, for me, it's been very much I think a, a journey of okay, let's try these things and see how it helps me. And what's make what I found to be amazing about this stuff is that tiny changes or tiny almost mantras even or tiny ideas can have a totally life-changing effect on you mm -hmm. right so for example when i realized someone said to me once um so i, I was talking about this with some friends in a, in a business mastermind group and they said man have you ever read michael singer mm -hmm. so no who's michael singer so okay go and read um two books uh, the untethered soul and um oh i'm blanking on the second one now uh the surrender experiment Guy uh, built a multi-billion dollar company um, by basically surrendering to outcomes and saying, like, I I'm just going to surrender to the, the universe here, whatever the universe is telling me. Big into meditation and yoga, like incredible books. And, and then, so the guy recommended these books to me and he said, you know what your problem is, Ollie? You are attached <laughs> to outcomes. You're attached mm -hmm. to outcomes. And I was like, damn. And I thought about it and, I re and, it, and that was enough to make me realize across my whole life, Everything was an outcome. I must be fluent in Japanese. I must, I must drop 10 pounds. I must, uh, you know, do achieve X results in my business. Yeah. You want to uh, be Bradley I'm, Cooper and Limitless basically. There you go. Yeah. So to bring it back to language learning, I, one of the things that I realized from that was like, I really got myself, um, tied up in this need in the, in this, in this goal of really like being perfect in Japanese. Cause Japanese is a language that's very special for me. I lived in Japan for three and a half years. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was like, hang on, man, for the last 10 years since I've left Japan, I've been beating myself up the whole time for not being perfect. What kind of a way to live? I don't want to live like that. It makes no sense. So I, I just made a resolution. So I'm going to, what do I need to do to enjoy this language now? So I started reading books. I started taking weekly, weekly lessons uh, with a Japanese person. And I'm so, I was just so much happier mm. immediately just by, just by kind of relinquishing that, that need, that outcome. Non-attachment to the outcome. And so that, that's why, again, bring it back full circle. This is why I kind of say to people, you know, when you ask me, you know, what would you say to the person who's like going on this full immersion thing? I'd say, man, you know, think hard about what you're doing because, yeah, it's going to work if you keep at it, but mm. happiness may well lie elsewhere. Yeah, and it's definitely, def definitely tactics, going back to tactics, applying that to multiple aspects of your life for sure. Is that how you just, is that how you kind of discovered your language learning protocol is th is through you seeing the world at a different lens or did you already have that in place no. already? No, this is a more recent thing for me. This is this gotcha. has come about because because I am um, I am I'm at a kind of stage in life where you know I have a I have a fairly large business um, which is a whole different skill set. And you know, having to learn to mm -hmm. to scale scale a business, managing managing employees, and um, investing in other companies, your, and it's your funnel's good. Me, like... You have a good funnel. I went through. <laughs> I went through it. It's really good. 
Thank you very much. Um, I um, that, that, that's difficult. It's stressful, and I've mm. um, I've had to deal with all kinds of all kinds of emotions around that, and like discover these new parts to myself. And you know, how do you manage? How do you manage stress? How do you manage um, amounts of money that I'm not used to having? All, all these kind of things. So I, I, I've had to kind of seek this. I've had to go on on a quest for these answers more recently because of these things that um, mm. the business in particular has been kicking up for me. Um, but with languages, um, you know, the way that, the way that I learned my languages was not through that approach at all. The way that I learned through that my languages was through like bloody mindedness and hard work. Mm. And right. I would I would um, I would just really go go for it. And I was um, I was working very very hard. And, um, and so, you know, earlier on, you asked me like, what, if, if you were to distill language learning to its simple elements, <laughs> what would it be? And I never gave you an answer to it, but let me give you an answer now. Um, it is the things that I mentioned about what I did in Paris when I was in, when, when I was in French. So it's, uh, it is immersion of some kind in the language so that you're listening to it every day. It is active focus so that you're studying it or actively engaging with the language whether that's through textbooks or just paying attention um, and then it is the opportunity to practice regularly with a safe with a safe person because then you have the environment the mindset and the conditions and then it creates this kind of this kind of flywheel um, and i kind of feel that most people take care of the study side of things but they don't spend enough time listening or reading the language or practicing speaking it in a concentrated way uh, and but those are the three things that i've always done a lot of when i um when i've learned a new language and i'm just taking it very seriously right do you think flashcards and using anki is not a waste of time but not as efficient as doing full immersion or reading they can be complementary so the way that i mean i use flashcards um not a great not as much as i used to the way that i like to use flashcards is as 5% of the overall method mm. as a, a kind of a reinforcement mechanism for the most important things. So when I see people using flashcards, like they're spending 95% of their time on flashcards <laughs> and 5% of their time on reading or whatever, I suggest flipping it, spend most of your time doing something else and then use flashcards to reinforce the stuff that you really want to learn. So for example, if you're reading a story and there's a phrase so someone's a character in the story says something like, Hey, let's go for a drink tomorrow. And you're like, man, that's a useful phrase. I want to learn that phrase. Hmm. Um, so then I would take that phrase. Let's say it's in Spanish. Vamos a tomar algo mañana. And then you write that on the flashcard. Vamos a tomar algo mañana. Um, and then, uh, so you capture the phrase on the flashcard and then maybe you put the English on the other side. Like let's, let's go for a drink tomorrow. Uh, and then I would be very selective with the stuff that goes on the flashcards. And it's only stuff that I really want to remember. So then I, I'll study the flashcards, but I'll use it as a way to reinforce concepts, phrases, words that I've taken from my main study, which is mm -hmm. reading and listening. What made you start like in your programs, in your books? Why was it reading that you wanted to emphasize? Why did, why did you think reading was the best way to start for you? So not, not so for you learning, but for you to sell to other people and teach other people. Yeah. Well, so specifically it's, I'd say it's stories and that the, the reading is the most visible part of that. Cause we, cause we sell books and we have books in the bookshops. So that's the stuff that you see, but mm -hmm. the audio is actually a key component of that as well. But reading specifically, um, here's why, because you can do it anywhere. Mm. And I think a lot of people, um, you, know, you can't watch movies all day. Uh, you can't be you can't be um, you can't be speaking to people all day, but you can be reading all the all the time and listening to the audio of that all the time. So mm. the thing with stories is that it is it fits into this category of it's the method that makes sense in the medium that makes it doable. So mm. you know how many how many lang how many sessions with a teacher can you schedule? per week i mean you could do it every day if you were really hardcore but then still it's only half an hour a day right how much time can you how many movies can you watch there okay, well, you, yeah, you could watch a movie a day in the language if you want but um you know 
not easy. But with reading, it's, it's time consuming for sure. Yeah, time consuming. It's not a very good way of. It's not a very good mode. Like it's difficult right. to study when you're watching TV. But reading, you can do it anywhere, and it's the best mode of study because you can follow the words, you can look at words, you can skip forward, skip backwards. It's the it's the best best of all worlds. Does the audio book come with when somebody buys your book? Let's say beginner Spanish or one of your stories. Yeah. Does it come with audio book or no? So my programs do. So our story learning programs, which teach you languages like from zero beginner or intermediate or whatever. So all of those courses come with the audio. Um, the books don't, um, mostly because um, you know if you you know if you buy a novel on Amazon. You know, you don't expect the audio book to come with it, right? You, you get it. No, exactly. no, for sure. But but it is available, right? If somebody oh, it's available. Want... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Now, everything we make. Every... Want... Okay, okay. Yeah, everything we make comes with comes with text and audio, and that's like a core part of the of the method. Because mm. one of the things we say is, okay, read, and then read and listen at the same time, and then listen while you're jogging or something, and so it gives you all these different ways to reinforce what you're learning. For sure. Do you think that because you're listening and reading that's kind of how your approach is with the books in your course but let's say you're trying to learn spanish and you put on narcos with spanish subtitles is that essentially the same thing as reading with an audiobook because you're yeah you're you're it's hearing question you're seeing and you're also and there's also a story being played with actors or is there some component about books specifically that makes the difference so the thing with books as opposed to TV is that you are you, the, the density of information that you can consume is much higher. So if you're watching a movie, let's say an hour-long episode of, of Narcos, the actual amount of Spanish you get exposed to in that time is not that much because there's a lot mm. of scenes that play out in the meantime with no dialogue. Um, and also, it's not, it's, it's not easy to rewind, watch again, like if you wanted to read a sentence three or four times, it's not comfortable to do that when you're watching Netflix, for example. Right. It's just not it's not a good mode of study. But when let, now let's imagine you've got the transcript of that episode written out in text form. Well, you could get through that in far less time by reading it. But not only that, you could then go back and read read it again, skim forward, skim backwards. So what 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 did he say five minutes ago? And you go back and you. You could easily mm. check. So it's just Should the fact that you've... That? Sorry? Though? Should you be doing that? Should you actually, if you're just starting off, should you analyze every single aspect of the sentence or should you just let it roll and then go back afterwards? So if you're just starting out, then it's inevitable that you're going to have to go back over things because everything's new. Every word? So... What I like, so the, the directions that I give, so let's say um, you're coming to come into me on day one of Spanish. You don't know, a, you don't know a, a thing in Spanish. Mm -hmm. My approach is I'm going to give you a chapter, chapter one of a, of a story. And I'm going to say to you, read it five, 10 times, and then listen to the audio five, 10 times. Um, and I'm going to say to you, don't worry about every word. Don't look up any words. Don't beat yourself up if you don't understand. Just read it. And then um, what will happen is every time that you read it, your brain will start to pick up a little bit more. And so we're looking for, what we're really looking for is that the amount of ground you cover is more important. And the main reason is that as soon as you start to look up individual words, what happens is you move from this mode of, input and, con and consuming the language to mm. study mode and you grind to a halt before you know it you're looking up every word in the dictionary and then you spend one hour on the first page mm. and that's the so that's the problem it's not that there's anything wrong with looking up words it's like hey what does that come at the cost of and if you kind of map this out over a period of days weeks months years the difference between someone who just reads and consumes tons of content and the person who looks up every word, it's a huge amount of difference in the amount of Spanish you're actually going to be able to cover. Mm. You know, one person has like looked up a thousand words and probably forgotten all of them. 
The other person right. has actually read read thousands of pages of Spanish and has been exposed to a hundred thousand times more of words. But it, it, eventually, you're going to have to look it up in your native language, right? Because yeah, if you never look up the word mañana, uh, obviously we know what that means, right? But if you don't look yep. up, if you never look it up, you just have it from stories. It's going to be. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's going to be impossible to learn a language. You're going to have to translate some of it. You can't just read kanjis and then after doing after reading it something that you have no idea what you're looking at without translating it into english let's say you're a native english speaker that you're going to yep. understand like there has to be a time where you start looking up sentences and words right or no yep so again we want to make a distinction between like the, your first few weeks and your first month and what right. happens after that right so at the beginning yes you you're going to you're going to want to look up words for sure and the way that i handle this the way that I adapt my method to cater for this is that I that I give you very simple stories. All right, so you don't want to be reaching for a for a Don Quixote on your first day. You know, you, you I give you a very very simple story right. where a lot of the words you can actually guess from English because they are what what are called cognates. So they are words like uh, la nación, for example, which is the nation. Uh, mm -hmm. You can guess it right, and with a little bit of training, you can quite quickly guess words which are almost the same in, in English and Spanish. All right, so so the, by giving you a very simple story, chock full of words that you can guess, actually, pretty quickly, you're understanding 30 to 50% of the, of the story, All right? And, and then from there, what happens is, like, yes, you, you're going to have to look up some words, but what happens is pretty quickly, as long as you keep learning with stories at the right level, you can start to guess words mm. because you already understand the context. And so... Um, guess words so in English or the targeted yeah, language? Yeah. In, in, in the Spanish, hmm. and it doesn't happen straight. It doesn't happen straight away. But see, one of the key skills um, in reading, and this is the same when you're learning English as a, as a kid or or whatever, is to be able to guess meaning from context. That's the teaching term, right? So guess meaning from context, and what that means is um, that based on the context of what you're reading, you can deduce what the word is. Hmm. So, for example, um, tell me what this word is. I was I, I I got off the bus. It was raining heavily. I put my foot. I got off the bus, put my foot right down into a X, and my foot mm -hmm. was soaking wet. What's, yeah, the, what's the word X? Puddle. Right there you go. So so right. so designed in the right way, these. Um, that what can happen is you, you can develop this skill for guessing. Right. And so, yes, you want to look up certain words, but you don't want to get sucked into that because it just then it just takes over everything else. Um, mm. And then you gradually to build up this cycle of, of, um, of, of, of learning more and more. Right. And your stories are written a certain way. It's not just, you're not writing, writing Little Red Riding Hood or Three Little Bears. It's actually written for you to, to help you learn a language. Kind of like that show. In, what's that show in Spain? Extra? Was that the show in Spain where it was like a cringy wannabe friends type show, but it was catered around learning languages, but it's actually pretty good. Was it, was oh, it cool. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen it. But. I think it's called extra. Yeah. I, you can watch them on YouTube, like really shitty quality, but um, the, not quality of the show. Like on YouTube, people like stream it. So it's, it's like in 360 right. P, but it's actually pretty good. And they go through and it's in, I think it's in Barcelona, but <laughs> It's kind, yeah, but so, that's kind of the format, though. They film that show to like the whole point is to make you learn the language. It's not about just watching Seinfeld or watching Friends, and that's kind of how yeah. your books are written. The same, right? I would assume. Yeah. So my books are not for complete beginners because they are books of short stories. So you can't, as a beginner, you can't just pick them up and start reading. That they they come in more around the intermediate level where you're mm -hmm. ready to start reading more <clears throat> more natural more natural stuff. But to, but to be clear, because I, I know that. People, when they listen to this, they hear they they, they get very obsessed over this thing. Okay, well, I'm just a beginner. I can't read stuff on day one. So how does it work? So mm. um, the one of the big problems in with immersion in general, to bring it back to immersion, is you've got to have the right material, right? Because if you if you if you try and get like if you buy if you try to read Don Quixote on day one, you're you're screwed because it's just not at your level. Mm. So. The method that I'm describing here for beginners is I, mean, I had to design entire programs in order to teach this stuff because you can't you can't go and buy 
stories <laughs> written for, for zero beginners. So like that's that's why my whole story learning um, system and, and courses exist because um, because I have to I had to kind of write the stories and then write the teaching videos that go, so that as a beginner you kind of have a pathway through. Mm. Um, because it is like in the early stages, it's delicate and you and, it, and it's easy to lose motivation or, or try to use stuff that's too hard. So you would recommend someone that's just literally just starting off, like they want to learn Japanese, they don't know anything about Japanese culture, they don't know anything about kanjis, they don't even know what kanji means. You would recommend don't buy my books, join my course. Don't buy my books. Don't buy my books. They're not for beginners. Yeah. Okay. But the beginner like courses. The uh, course is for beginners. Is. I forget, but yeah. And okay. it's, so it's like so essentially think of it think of it like this. The the courses are designed to teach you the language from zero from a beginner and they mm. build you up to an intermediate level or a low intermediate level where mm -hmm. you then can start to take my books and and then read more extensively. Right. Essentially I'm kind of building are, a the courses are framed around same concept though, language learning stories. through stories. Through stories, yeah. It's just that they're very simple at the mm. beginning. And I'm also teaching you about what you're reading. So you read something and then I teach you about it. So I say, hey, mm. you remember that that word that you saw here in the story? I know you didn't understand it when you read it. Now let me tell you about it. Uh, so you're just I'm helping you kind of uncover the language from the story uh, rather than um, rather than the traditional approach, which is, hey, here's a list of words. Go and memorize them without any kind of context right. at all. Yeah, that's boring. It where do people find your course? What's the name of your website? Sure. So you can go to storylearning.com and um, that's my, that's my okay. website. Story, storylearning.com has, um, yeah, you'd be that, that, that's where you can find access to, gotcha. links or to just all, all of our programs. Just Google Ollie Richards. You, if you Google Ollie Richards, you, you'll have to sift through like 10 million different articles and videos and things like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, if you search, if you search story learning, then it, then the website should come up somewhere near the top. Gotcha. Well, it's on your YouTube channel. I'm assuming the, like the links are in your videos. They are. I mean, I'm I'm very kind of, although I, I, I'm kind of aware that this this whole conversation it kind of sounds like one big plug for for, for story learning. Normally, with my content, I'm um, I, I'm not so. Um, I, I tend to I, t I tend not to 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 plug my yeah. stuff all that much. I'm kind of like, here's some really helpful stuff, and if you right. like it, well, you know. This is not Come a. Over here. <laughs> that's a good point, though, you guys. This is definitely not a plug. Like, if I, if I didn't agree with what he was saying, I would definitely tell you, okay, great, and I would push harder and push harder until the point where we were both looking at each other, and then that's it. I truly do believe, because I've tried multiple things, that you have one of the best approaches. There's multiple good approaches, and I think the best way to learn any language is to stack multiple approaches, and you know. It's like going to the gym. The more things you do about fitness, you're going to become a better athlete. If you're just focusing on being strong and powerlifting, sure, you might get strong, but your endurance is probably going to suck, right? And that's kind of the same thing with language learning or learning any skill. How many different avenues and, and I guess, highways to get to your desired location, that's kind of how I view language learning and really anything. And I think yours is one component of it, depending on what stages you are, but I think when it comes to the very, very beginning, to be honest, and this is not a plug, I think your approach is by far the best, uh, stacking that with emergent. Uh, but yeah. it's not a plug. It's not a, this is not a paid advertisement. Ali did not pay me to get on the show. This <laughs> is strictly because I wanted to talk to him and I, and I value what he does. And I think if you are just starting off, uh, I've done, I've gone through all of them. This is by far, in my opinion, the best approach. I mean, I, I listen. I I really appreciate that, but but again, like I, I'm always very clear in, in in all of my stuff that I don't I don't think there is a best concept, a, a best approach because w w so what I try and do is I I I I try and say look, hit, I spent 20 years of my life learning languages. This is what I learned, and I've I've and I've I try to create a way for other people to learn in that way, if you want it, if it sounds like mm -hmm. your 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 cup of tea. Um, but, but it's really, is one of many methods and the method that what I want you to do is to find the method that works best for you, that mm -hmm. sings to you, that makes you excited to, to step to it every day. Um, I want you to find that. And if, and if that, whatever that is, I want you to, 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 to double down on that for yourself because, yeah. you know, ultimately the thing that's made, that's allowed me to learn a lot of languages over the years has been learning what works for me and doing that. Because like, like with anything, it's like, it's like um, 
just the same with fitness. Once you know what works for you, you don't give a shit what anyone else says because you 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 know that that you must know that feeling of like when you truly you truly own something when you've tried so much stuff and you discovered what works for you and you're like, man mm. that I know myself I know my DNA and this is what what gels with me and I just know this with every fiber of my being um that is the most powerful possible place to be and that's what I right. want everyone to find in their own right. language learning true true but <laughs> there's a but coming <laughs> but come on Ali let's, let's keep it real there's definitely better approaches then there isn't in anything, right? I could teach you how to be an engineer one way versus somebody teaches you how to become an engineer the other way. And nine times out of 10, if we were to do, if we were to run the numbers, this person has a better chance of learning engineering from this way than that way. doesn't mean it's impossible. It doesn't mean you might not jive with it. Obviously, if you hate to read or, or whatever, they just don't like you in general, then yeah, okay, maybe go with refold or go with Babel. But that's not going to be the case because you're a likable person. I'm just saying like nine times out of 10, if we were to run the numbers on what's the most successful method, and I know a lot of polyglots hate this, uh, the most successful method, especially for pure beginners that have no idea what the hell's going on, I would say that your approach is one of the best. And then there's other approaches that I favor, but there's definitely, like, come on, there's definitely better approaches to well, learning see, things I'll, in I'll, life. I'm going to argue against myself here because like I, <laughs> because, because, well, it you can't say there's what, not better way. There's not better approaches to learn certain things. If I learn from a neurosurgeon how find, to do brain surgery versus a, a somebody else that kind of knows how to do it, he's probably has a better like systematic process on how to learn. So I don't think it's a good parallel because oh, okay. because there is a there's um, although but you know granted I don't know the first thing about neuro neurosurgery, but um, you know with languages you can find people who have learned in all different ways who are as good as each other and are highly successful. This is, this is the irony of all of this, right? You can find people who have, who have learned tons of languages in the craziest ways. The common denominator though, in every case is these are, these are seriously dedicated people who will stop at nothing to achieve their, that's true. Their, 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 their results. Right. So it's not about the method, like attitude trumps method every day of the week. Um, I, I really believe this. right, 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 right. And you can make anything work. Uh, so I think the the best we can do when talking about language methods is to speak in terms of the conditions that need to be in place in order for you to learn a language. And those conditions are massive amounts of input through reading and listening, um, the opportunity to speak a lot with someone who is comfortable to speak with, who will give you the time of day, motivation to keep going, time to let the learning happen, let it sink in, let your, let your brain process it. Um, and um, I think that's it. It's the, it's the, yep. it's the, it's, uh, it's massive amounts of input. It is, I'm going to forget it now. It's massive, massive amounts of input. <laughs> it's, uh, it's time. It is right. motivation. And what was the, what was the other one? It was input Person time. to speak to yep. and, and, and the opportunity, the opportunity to speak. Shout out to italki.com. So any, listen, anyone that has learned a language to a high level will have done those things. They might've taken mm -hmm. it different, different ways around it. But, it right. but if you think about it, you can't be getting the language without being highly motivated. You can't learn to speak without a lot of speaking. You can't know the language without a lot of input. Um, and you can't learn a language in six weeks. You need time to let it process. Exactly. You will and not that, find someone who hasn't, got right. those four things exactly and then that was kind of like my point right is my point was assuming you're in the right s state of mind you're motivated you're a diehard you're not going to give up on what you're doing then i think now it's like okay once we have the mindset down now what are what's the protocol on the best way to do this and i know everyone learns differently or whatever the hell but i'm telling but there are better ways and that the way you just structured that out was exactly what people want to hear that was perfect, yeah. and so and, I, and so the best. I think you're part so, of that. So the best, the best, the best methods, if we if, if we can say that, are going to be the methods that promote those four things. And, exactly. Um, and and it's and it's so it's not necessarily a case of <laughs> testing what to see which one works, but it's just going to be, it's just going to be you know which just gels with individuals enough to make that make exactly. those conditions in play. 
Exactly. But I, but yeah, I think story learning is awesome. But <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, so I, I personally believe story learning is the best. But um, I did talk to another person about language learning, and uh, he he didn't say the same. But you know, to each his own, right? Uh, kind of what you said. How many languages do you offer in your course? Um, I think we have ten languages now. We do. Let me see if I can okay. if I can get through them: French, Spanish, uh, Italian, German, Japanese, Mandarin, Chinese um portuguese korean russian and turkish and uh, latin is on the way oh nice okay so let's say that you wanted to learn persian farsi and it, and mm. ollie richards doesn't offer that for a not a i would i don't want to say a rare language because a lot of people speak farsi there's a lot of persian people one of my partners is, is persian he speaks fluent farsi that's why i'm asking because i want to learn it to communicate with him and become closer to him and his culture yeah but if you are trying to find a language that's probably not the most popular language like farsi where yeah. w- what would be your approach if they can't come to ollie richards or they can't go to sure. refold they can't find movies or books in farsi how would someone approach that if it's not fully okay. available so let's map it out based on those four four criteria we, we talked about earlier so number mm-hmm. one if you remember was huge amounts of input so how are you going to get that yeah I'm asking, I'm asking you, uh, how are you going <laughs> to get that input? Without reading and without watching movies? That could be and part besides, of it. And besides going to Iran? Uh, well, reading and watching movies would be a good start. Right. Mm, but what if the movies aren't, like they're too advanced, right? Does, does that have a, compo- does that matter? So, so here's what I would do, because I want to get, oh, I know that specifics are helpful here. Number one, I'd find a Farsi textbook. Okay. Because you, you can find find a, a Farsi textbook that you like and go through it from top to bottom. Because that's going to give you the, the basics. Number two, I would, um, in the case of Farsi specifically, learn to read and write the script immediately because it's not hard. I think there's 26 letters, 26, 28 letters in Farsi. Mm-hmm. I don't quite know that. It's in the region of that, though. Right. Uh, so it's, it's doable. So learn it at the beginning and then watch as many movies as you can get your hands on. And I would say specifically go for, for through a period of time of switching out all of your English content to Farsi content. Mm. So don't watch no more, no more Netflix in English. You have a rule <laughs> only watch, only watch movies in Farsi. And if you don't understand it, it doesn't matter. Your brain will start to take it in. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So basically the same concept that you have, but there's not as many tools as like you're Spanish working with or, what you've got. Right. You're working with what you've got exactly, so so that's 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 the first bit. That's the that's the massive amounts of input. Mm. Uh, number two, motivation sounds like you're motivated, so that's cool. Um, number three, an opportunity to opportunity to speak with a, a kind of safe person. I would say, yeah. um, don't do this. Don't look to your partner for for Farsi pra- for speaking practice because yeah. it doesn't work. It doesn't work. In most cases, it doesn't work. It ends up being strained, not natural, an inconvenience, an imposition. So instead, go to italki, sign up for weekly Farsi lessons. Mm. When somebody goes to italki to learn any language, what should they look for in a teacher? Because obviously, they like. just someone they like. Someone they like. Again, we, we don't want to. We don't want to. We don't want to eighty twenty this. We want to. We want to. We, we <laughs> you don't understand, Ali. That's how our my brain. <laughs> functions and that's my listeners are very like tim ferris yeah. type people so 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 i would say take lessons with five people and then choose the one or two that you just vibe with the best okay because if you vibe with them you'll keep it up and that's the that's by far the bigger the bigger gotcha. goal all right okay. so to recap we've got the textbook to go through step number one mm. then you've got um movies and some simple stories if you can find them maybe you can maybe you can maybe you can't right um that's the that's the immersion number two got the motivation which is already taken care of number three you're going to find a couple of people who you can speak with on a a weekly basis and it's going to be super basic but whatever keep it fun and number four the last one then is time so what do you make of the time thing what do you think is the important lesson to take from that Uh, what do you mean about time so time being one of the the four conditions okay that, that you need to succeed right. what is the 
going so after all the things we've just described what do you think is the key thing to remember about time as besides, a, as a it, besides it's going to take time right but what, so so it's going to take time so what is the kind of what what mindset do you have to take into into this you have to accept failure That's right. you have to accept that this is going to be a long haul and to enjoy the process yeah that, okay that's it that's it that's exactly it so it's 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 not beating yourself up if you if it's hard if you don't understand not worrying about making mistakes it's right. like it's just like the gym man turning up week <laughs> after day after day week after week like get rid of all attachment to outcomes just go through the process and if you do that for a year i guarantee you you'll be conversational by the end of the year interesting okay so i asked benny lewis this and he I don't want to, your answer to, to be skewed by his answer, which I don't think it would anyway, because you're a language learning expert uh, in your own right. But you do speak multiple languages. You speak eight. Is it possible to learn multiple languages at the same time? Or do you think it's a waste of time? Do you think it's confusing? Because now you're mixing all this learning is getting mixed into your yeah. brain at the same exact time. Well, what's your take on becoming a polyglot? So in general... I would say don't learn languages at the same time because it's hard enough to learn one. And, um, and, and learning a language to a large extent involves depth of focus. All right. So um, the, the way that you get results in a language is by going as deep as you can. Surround yourself with more, spend more time, um, have more conversations. Like it's that depth of focus that, will get you results so that like it's highly correlated right the depth of your focus and results will be and so every time you introduce another la a second language or a third language you're just diluting your focus so if we're talking pure you know all things being equal efficiency i would say stick with one language learn that well and the confidence you get from that will allow you to learn more if you want now the caveat is None of this matters anyway, so you may as well enjoy yourself. So learn three languages at the same time. <laughs> yeah, right. But not optimal. Got it. Not optimal. <laughs> do you think maybe you should, do you think a good approach, because this is kind of like what I thought would be a pretty decent approach is every eight months or nine months, or maybe you could just say a year, every 12 months, you learn a language, hardcore, full immersion, whether it's reading through courses like yourself or doing the refold method or doing all of, all of the above and you spend 12 months, let's say, for example, Spanish. And it's like, okay, cool. I'm pretty decent at Spanish. Now I'm going to learn German. And I'm going to translate in my head the translation uh, of German words into Spanish to keep my Spanish fresh, but also double down on my Spanish and then learn German at the same time uh, so I can keep that. And then every 12 months, I learn a new language. So in you know, 10 years, I have 10 languages that I learn and you're translating them. I also have a question about translating your native language versus your target language. But what would you say about that? Every 12, every eight to 12 months, learn a new language only. And then that would be like your scale. Like every eight months, you learn a new language and then you use your old language to translate the words in your new language. Yeah. So that's kind of what I did in the early years. I learned Sp uh, French and then Spanish and then uh, Portuguese. Um that's that's kind of what I did, and it and it's definitely definitely works. I think there's a couple of things to say. Number one, you want to make sure that the language you're working on for those eight months, you get to a uh, an upper intermediate or B two, as it's known in the, in, the, in the Common European Framework um, level, because there's a level at which you won't forget a language, no matter how long, and and that's the level it's B two, which means okay. you are pretty conversationally. Uh, proficient you know you're, you're, you can understand most things say most things get to that level first um, because if you if you're any lower what will happen is you'll start to get super confused and you'll forget mm. stuff mm. so that's the kind of principle there it's like get get your language to a very very proficient conversational level before you even think about another language um, and um, and so because of that for that reason, I think that's the number one thing to remember. And so because of that, I'd say if you any attempt to guess how long it's going to take you is get is almost certainly going to be wrong. So Understand. I think it's what, a good, what were the it's levels a, that someone could gauge if they wanted to like actually yeah. track it? 
So this is something called the Common European Framework of Reference, or CEFR, and it's a system that we use in, in Europe um, and quite widely around the world, actually, for gauging levels. And those levels go up from A to B to C. So we have A, a being the most basic and C being the most proficient. So you have A1 and A2, a, and then you have B1 and B2, and then C1 and C2. So C2 is like hardcore, mm. academic mm. standard. A1 is very early stage beginner. Mm. Gotcha. And if you go okay. online, um, if you go online, you can just type in CEFR level descriptors. You can see what those levels um, involve. So don't move on until you're a B1, you said? B2. B2. So until you get to B2, don't even think about going to another language in general. I, I, again, if we're talking about like optimum efficiency. So I found in the... so, and, But let me give you an example. So I found... so. For example, my French was at B2 level when I was 20 years old. I've hardly mm. spoken French since I left Paris, but I still remember pretty much everything. I can speak very, very mm. well. Because you got to that level. Because I got to that level. Now, my Arabic, on the other hand, because I lived in Egypt for a year. Oh, wow. And and Qatar as well for a year and a half before that in, in the Gulf. My Arabic was probably A2. So mm. significantly less. I could kind of hold a conversation. Kind of. <laughs> and um, I, I left uh, I left Egypt, moved back to the UK. Within six months, I've forgotten everything. And I can hardly speak Arabic today. Really? So you don't think if you did a review course, you would it would be like riding a bike? I would need a couple of months to get back. Really, a couple of months. That's kind yeah, of long. I think, I, I think so. But Arabic is a very hard language, so it's kind of it's, it is it's, it's different, really. Um, but the point is that, like, if you, what is the point of learning a language? You you mm. want it, it unless it's just a, like a. People want to show off. Come on, Ali. They want to be Bradley Cooper. They do and take girls on dates and speak Japanese to at the sushi restaurant and totally impress their girlfriend. Duh. And I highly recommend doing all. <laughs> I highly recommend doing all of that. Um, but you also want it for life, right? And you know, I can say that one of the one of the um, one of the biggest joys in my life right now, for example, is when my daughter speaks to to her mum, to my wife in Cantonese because she's from Hong Kong. I can understand everything they talk about. Oh, that's amazing. Um, and when we go to Hong Kong, no, not so much anymore since the uh, CCP uh, did their thing. But, but you know, when we go to Hong Kong, we have in Hong Kong, I mean, my spoken Cantonese is not, not, it's not super good, um, mm -hmm. but I can understand everything, right? So I can exist in that world with them and, and, and be there. I can travel to, I'm going to Portugal next week. I'm going to be able to go there um to speak to everyone in Portuguese. I'm going to Argentina in um, October for my friend's wedding. I'm going to be able to sp speak Spanish the whole time there. I wow. I, I enjoy speaking Japanese on a, on a weekly basis with with friends and tutors. That for me is one of the most fulfilling things about my life, and I I just love it to bits. But it's only there because I've kind of got those languages to a level where I right. I know them well and I can maintain them. So. It seems a massive shame to spend six months learning a language because you can, and then just to forget it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, language, language learning in general is extremely hard, right? So if you can learn something, or even if you have a normal conversation, a basic conversation, like, how are you? Great. I'm doing good. Where are you? Great. Awesome. And then you can actually say to yourself, wow, I actually talked to someone in Egyptian Arabic. Yeah. That's pretty awesome, man. You don't have to do electrical engineering in Egyptian Arabic to yeah. feel good about yourself. And it goes back to what you're saying. It's about the journey, right? And enjoying the process. Have you ever, did you ever take it? I have to ask this because I'm a, once again, huge fan of uh, Limitless. Did you ever uh, go on a date with a girl before you were married to a, uh, a cultured restaurant and speak that language and didn't tell the girl and she just looked at you like you had four heads? You know what? I don't think so. And the reason is that usually I would use the language as the way in to meet her in the first place. Uh, so she or she would already know. I know your style, Ali. You know, so uh, 
otherwise, like I would have had to meet her in English and pretend that I didn't speak the language mm. at all. And that for Even me, if is it was, weird. what if it was a, a British girl? Oh, oh yeah. Well, I guess so. I guess so. Like, um, I always wanted to do that. I don't know. Like, the thing is, it becomes it, after this is going to sound this is going to sound um, big headed, but there is a there is a there's a point where it becomes so normal that you just um, that it, you you just um, you don't even you don't even think about it. So it's very often that we'll be in, um, you know, I'll meet, meet friends and go to a, a restaurant in London and and and, the, and um, the staff are Brazilian and I just start talking Portuguese and the people that I'm with are like, well, what the hell? Um, <laughs> same with Japanese. If we go to a Japanese restaurant, I'll order in Japanese. Um, I guess the people I'm with may or may not know that. It it like for me, languages are a lifestyle, and mm. I just love it. And and it and it becomes. Yeah, I don't even I don't even think about it. You know, That's I really awesome. I That's awesome. genuinely don't think about it. It just it's just part of part of right. life. So I, I do have another technical question. How do you stop translating your targeted language from your uh, native language? That transition, like, okay, yeah, this means that, this means that. How do you stop doing that and just only speak in your native language and stop translating it in your head? So the, the reason that you translate in your head is because the only frame of reference you've got is your native language, right? So the, you know, the only way you know to express meaning is in English. And if you use, the more that you use kind of more traditional approaches like flashcards and stuff, the only way that you can get to a full sentence in the target language is by piecing together words one by one mm. based on what you want to say, right? So if you want to say, I am um, doing an interview, then you have to, then you have to kind of construct it. Okay, I am doing an interview uh, one by one. Now, one of the reasons that learning through stories or any other kind of input-based approach is so powerful is the after the more time you spend reading and listening to the language, the closer you get to a point where your brain just starts to make sense and understand how meaning is created in that language. And so it becomes natural at a point to to just you you you've read so much you've listened to so much that you just know how meaning is expressed and so you don't need to rely on your english anymore right which is where the translation comes from so right. what what's required is you've got to get your target language to a point where you understand what meaning is and how meaning is expressed in that language and i know that sounds a bit kind of um bit slippery as a as a as a concept but it is it's about uh the just about the, the amount of time you spend immersed in the language and that's so that that that's why uh immersion or input based approaches are so powerful because it just it gets you to that stage as the fastest way okay that's helpful if somebody is going to paris in 2 months they don't have time to do full immersion, all the yeah. BS. What's the best way to just have a normal conversation with people? Okay, good question. So this comes back to goals. If you're going to Paris in two months, let's let's just assume that this is not part of a bigger French, a bigger project to learn French and um, mm -hmm. become great at it. Well, you're kind of you're interested French in it. You are interested in learning it forever. But the main goal is I want to be able to speak some French in two months because I'm going to Paris with my wife or whoever. Sure. So, yeah. So so the, you're going to Paris. The goal here is to get by and to survive. Correct. Right? That's that, that's that's the goal. You, you, you're going with your family. You don't want to be caught short. Mm -hmm. So what I would do in that situation is um, I would get a very short um, textbook of some kind and I would... Um, go through it fairly quickly and then I would book teachers and I would take two or three lessons a week for the next two months practicing the stuff in that book so that um, and that achieves two things the first thing it achieves is it teaches you the stuff the language you're going to need there the words and phrases you'll actually need the second thing it achieves is it gives you practice actually using it because otherwise what happens is you can learn stuff from a textbook, but then when you get there, you freeze up mm. when you're actually face-to-face -face with someone. 
So there's two components to this. There's like learning what you need and then there's practicing it enough so that you're not going to freeze when you, when you arrive. And I would just focus very, very heavily on practical language for getting around ordering food, that kind of stuff. What about pronunciation? Um, I mean, yeah, it's like a, it's a yes, but answer. I think it's like, yeah, <laughs> you, you ideally want to know how to pronounce stuff. Right. But again, like if the goal is just, we've got to stay focused on the goal, right? If the goal is just getting by, right. then well, you can't have it all. And okay. But what about in general though? What about if you do want to master your pronunciation? Oh, right. Cause obviously that's important. Yeah. So my, my, my view on pronunciation is basically number one. Um, whenever you start learning a new language, you want to uh, really learn pronunciation well from the beginning. So mm. work with a teacher if you have to, I mean, in our, in our courses, we cover pronunciation in depth from the start. Um, for, for this reason. So find a resource of some kind and really learn the sounds of the language. So like if you're learning Arabic, for example, you need to learn the ayn, the ayn sound and the, 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 the breathy mm -hmm. letters. So like learn, like really spend time learning pronunciation from the start. And it's usually not that hard because m most languages have a lot of commonality with English. It's just a few different letters that you might need to, you might need to, to nail. Um, so spend time on pronunciation from the start. And then um, pronunciation is something that for me is mastered through speaking. So it's not something that I, I, I think is, 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 is that you get very far with kind of training in an isolated way. So, you know, once you're up and running in the language, I think what I try to focus on is two things. Number one, a lot of listening so that you know what you're trying to emulate. And then number two, regular speaking so that you can actually practice making those sounds um, that you're trying to emulate and, and the teacher can give you feedback. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, that's... That's your, that's your take on pronunciation? Yeah, it's like you can get very, very technical with pronunciation or you can just sort of stick with principles, which is which is the learn it on day one from the beginning and then lots of listening and speaking and mm. and then it, you know ask your teacher for feedback and then um you've got to create this feedback loop right that's what you need someone mm. needs to tell you that the way you said that thing is wrong <laughs> then you need to receive that feedback and you need to practice it over and over again so it's about again it comes back to that condition of um one of the conditions from earlier which is like having a safe person to speak to that safe person will tell you when you're screwing up mm. right and that's what you need you need you need that as part of the learning process. So you want to take that information on board and then keep, keep practicing, keep speaking, keep getting that feedback. Languages like Japanese and Korean with the, you know, with kanjis and, and then Arabic mm. scripture, Russian scripture. Basically if I'm talking native English speaker when, or maybe if you're a Japanese speaker and you're looking at English and you're starting with short stories, your style, the Ali Richard style or the Ali Richard method. Yeah. If, how is there a different approach of an English person, an English person learning German through reading versus an English person learning Japanese through reading because it's a completely different language? There's not, there's literally symbols instead of words. So the approach and the theory and the principles are exactly the same um, because the principles of, of what I've described here are bigger than. Right, difficult. Right, right. But I'm language. saying, yeah, I'm asking like a specific, like niche question: yep. is how does somebody get over that if they want? If they if, so, if they're joining, obviously, I, I should probably go through your course first before I interview. But uh, if somebody went to <laughs> it's Ali, quite, Richard, it's quite big. <laughs> yeah, if somebody goes to Ali Richards' course, right? Someone that doesn't know who you are, but they want to sign up. You know, what is that approach that you take when it comes to, sure. you know, reading kanjis versus reading, you know, German words or Spanish words? Sure. So as you've identified, if you're reading something in Spanish or, or German, for example, you can actually read the letters, which means exactly. you can you can make out the sounds of the words. And that is, um, although it seems hard to read in a new language, when you when you look at Chinese, you, you feel very grateful <laughs> that you're learning a language like German. So um, with Chinese and Japanese, you've got this added um, difficulty, which is Chinese characters. And in Japanese, you actually have three scripts. You have the hiragana and the katakana as well. Uh, they're easier to learn. 
but you have Chinese characters in Japanese and Chinese characters in Chinese. Now, the reality is you need to learn and memorize thousands of them on your journey to fluency in the language, mm -hmm. okay? Which is to say, it's hard. It's seriously damn hard. And it takes <laughs> years, right? This is the reality of it. It will take you, if you, if you went hell for leather, it would take you two to three years to learn all the Chinese characters that you would need to be able to operate in Chinese. It's a massive job. And it's operate, by far the most... As far as writing... Oh, both reading or writing. I mean, writing is even harder because you've got to produce. Reading mm -hmm. is comparatively easier because you can just recognize the characters. Got you. But you're not talking about speaking. Okay, I got you. Yeah, this is this is just being able to actually, even if we're talking about just re just being able to understand them. It's, it's years of work to learn mm -hmm. all the characters you have to. So this is unavoidable. And if you want to learn Chinese or Japanese, you've got to um, you've got to approach that at some point. Although you don't necessarily need to be able to read that stuff in order to speak. It's an important distinction. You can speak quite fluently without being able to read, but let's just, let's park that for now. Um, so with so our method, our story learning method is obviously based on reading stories and we do it from day one. So the way that we approach that in, uh, in our Mandarin Chinese program is to use what's called pinyin. And pinyin is the romanization uh, the standard romanization of Chinese characters. And so what that means is you can read uh, Chinese in the Latin alphabet, which is st mm. a standardized um, right. a standardized romanized alphabet, um, which means you can start to read the, the stories from the beginning. And we take the similar approach in Japanese. And so the thought process is this. I want you to start reading. Like, like my entire method relies on you reading and listening from the beginning. So I prepared to sacrifice reading, like learning Japanese, uh, Chinese characters at the beginning and using romanization instead so that you can spend time reading and listening and learning from the beginning. Because gotcha. that's, the that's the bigger goal. And it's, and, and it's going to take you years to learn the Chinese characters anyway. So what we do is we say, right, I want you reading and listening to Japanese from day one. So let's do that. And at the same time, we have a separate track which is right now let's learn to to read as well so we're working on that at the same at the same time the problem is if you said as purists at this point will say well how how could you possibly do that you know you that's that sacrilege you have to um you know you have to learn the the, the the chinese characters well the problem is if you say that we're not even starting our study our course of study until you've learned a thousand chinese characters see you've lost most people already at that point because it's too oh, hard. Oh, for sure. Yeah, they're never going to do that. That's not scalable. They're going to do it. They're just yeah. never. So this is like, it's pragmatics. It's like, I want you to get momentum. I want you to start. Um, so we use the uh, the pinyin system. And then at the same time, I'm teaching you Chinese characters. So that mm. ideally you're learning, you're getting motivated, and you're also building up your literacy at the same time. If you want to get to speaking the fastest possible, in Korean, Japanese, Ch uh, Mandarin, Chinese, Cantonese, whatever. Uh, obviously, reading, you said, is not important for speaking. Yeah. Uh, so if you just want to speak, you just want to go to China and have normal conversations, you really don't care about writing it, writing uh, in Mandarin symbols. You just want to speak. Is it important to learn the symbols at all? Or no, you could just use, use that system. It's a question of degree, right? So if you want to be able to just like very basic conversations, you know, where's the bathroom, uh, ordering food, getting train tickets, <clears throat> or introducing yourself, asking where someone's from. And it's got like, like really basic level stuff. You can memorize that stuff and learn to have simple conversations just by working with a teacher, you know? So you can just go to a teacher and say, like, I want you to teach me simple, some simple dialogues in, in the language. Your right. memory can, your, just through like rote memorization, it can take you that far. I'll grant, I'll grant that. Like for that, you don't, you don't need to use a method like mine or, or any kind of um, input-based method to get to a point where you can have basic back, back and forths and right. order a pizza, you know, <laughs> not that, not that you'd order a pizza in, in China, but you know what I mean? Um, so it really depends where you're happy getting to. 
if tourist French or tourist Chinese is your goal, then yeah, you probably don't want to do, do my stuff because it's just, it's, it's too in depth. What will happen though is, and this is, this is a lot of people have this experience. They learn the tourist stuff. They learn the kind of very basic conversational stuff. And then they hit a brick wall that they can't get past mm. because once you've learned the basic stuff, then you, then you're faced with the entirety of the language. that's like staring down at you like a colossal giant. And so then you're, then you're back to this question of, all right, what do I really want here? Do I want to mm-hmm. stay like a dumb tourist or do I want to actually learn the language? And then if you want to actually learn the language, then you're back to square one again because you just got, you got you you can't learn a language without being literate because there's simply too much to to learn. Got you. Okay. But if your main objective is just speaking, you can get to a certain point, but you will get hindered at that at a certain stage and then you have to learn the language symbols in order to get to the next level or you can get to max level you can get to c2 without knowing one kanji no that's not possible okay gotcha yeah. so that's important simply for be- here. yeah it, it, it's 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 important because because le- learning to be so imagine imagine i asked you this right so so justin imagine you've never read a book in your life how good would your spoke would your spoken english be if I never read a book in my life, uh, I'm just going to say probably not too good. You'd be able to speak, but it's like, right. if you imagine the kind of, the, 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 the kind of like take your like lowest view of someone in society and how they speak, you're going to talk mm-hmm. about that, right? Yeah. You're going to so, talk about cave. You're going to have caveman lingo. Maybe not, not that much, maybe, because just by being around and having grown up with other people, you will be able to speak. But we all know what what very uneducated people sound like when they talk, mm-hmm. and it and and so you hit this natural limit. All the books that you've read in your life, all the studying that you've done, the whole education system you went through at school, the essays you had to write, and on, on, on all that stuff, all of this contributes to how you um, speak and communicate. And it seems, so it's not just even about the words that you know or the, your ability to read and write. It's about the way that you express thoughts. Um, and so it's exactly the same in, a, in another language. If, if you, you can get a long way with just talking with people if you have enough time. Like if you can somehow figure out a way to just talk to people for two years nonstop, you can get quite far. Mm. But for most people, that's not, not, not practical. And you, then there's going to be a brick wall where you just don't know what stuff means and you just don't know what words are. So you to get to a high level in a language, you've got to engage with literacy. You've got to be able to read and write. Um, you've got to be able to, you've got to spend a lot of time with the language. Um, and it's also far faster, right? Because even if you could get to a high level with a language, you, you, everything is based on, like the only way you could learn anything just by speaking would be stuff that you hear people say. And you imagine how many thousands of things you'd have to memorize based on spoken interactions alone. It's crazy. Mm, Whereas right. if you're reading or watching movies and listening to stuff, then you're just getting so much more exposure and mm. so many more opportunities to learn. So it's a, it's a question of scale. It's a question of like, it's a question of like the, the size of the task ahead that I think people don't really realize just how much goes into learning to speak a language well. Interesting. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point is, you know, if you didn't read anything or you know, how good would your intellect and, you know, your intellectual capabilities be, how would you be able to express yourself? And yeah. it gets to the point where you probably would be very basic. It'd be very, maybe like you said, not caveman level, but a little bit above caveman level, I would say fifth grade level. Yeah, it's just you know? dumb, dumb talk. Yeah. You know? And exactly. that's in your first language. Right, that's in your native language. So now imagine taking that approach into your second language, and you begin to get a sense of the scale. You know, yeah. If someone hasn't mastered their their native language to a C two, then you know, should they even start learning another language to get to A one? Oh, well, I, I think uh, yeah. I mean, this 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 um. So Cato Lom said, "There's uh, the lang- uh, a foreign language is the only uh, thing in the world worth knowing badly," and I completely agree. <laughs> oh man. Yeah, because you think about it, and you think you're an expert at English, but you're not. I hear new words every day. I listen to whoever, Sam Harris, Elon Musk, all these giant intellectuals that you value their 
their intelligence and you're like, wow, I didn't, that's a new word. I'm going to look it up. Oh, I should incorporate that. And you think about we're always learning new languages, but how many people want to double down on their native language? Like for, in our case, English, there's definitely levels to a degree. You know, when you're talking to someone that's extremely smart and you know, you're talking to someone that's extremely dumb. Like, you know that. Yeah. You know, Intu- intuitively I, 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 or not, you have that feeling or you're gaining that aspect subconsciously or, or consciously. And I think it's funny that everyone's trying to learn new languages, but how many people have mastered their own language? And, and, and the reality is that you can't, you can't master your own language. It's never going to happen. It's, or again, at least it's, to a high level. So it, it all comes down to questions of degree, doesn't it? Like how, how much do you want, do you really want to do it? How much does it actually matter to you? Personally, I'm, I'm, I'm in the camp of, I'd rather know a lot of things to a good level than yeah. like one thing to a super high level. And I, I yeah. take that approach to everything. And uh, Right. You'd rather be the 80, you'd rather be 80% good at everything than the 1% good at one thing. Well, I want to experience life in as many different dimensions as possible. You know, that's why I'm so happy to, that's why I, I don't know, maybe it shouldn't go there, but, but you know, it's when I, when I, when I, when I talk about, when I, when I have conversations around kind of family and kids and stuff like that, and uh, mm-hmm. I, I totally understand that that's not for everybody, but I personally want to go through life experiencing as many different aspects of that as possible. Um, especially when it comes to the human experience. So you know, it seems to me that not not exper- like having a kid, for example, is so much a part of the human experience that, right. that I personally feel that it would be a huge um, disservice. I, if I if I didn't not to have kids for me would be to say like I just don't value. I'm going to miss out on so, so much of what it means to be alive, right? And so with with languages, I, t- I take the same same kind of view. It's like I I could spend the next 20 years mastering Chinese. But I think I'd get almost all of the, almost all of the benefits of doing that with like one or two years of study and then adding on another five or six languages. For so sure. So I could communicate with more people around the world. Yeah. It's, you know? it's opening your consciousness as widely as possible and becoming more wise. And you're going to, you're going to become, you're going to acquire more wisdom as you progress into life. However, if you're not diversified in your learning process, yes, you could theoretically become a master at one thing. You could become a master at pottery. What does that really mean to you when you die? And after you're dead, what impact did you have on the next generation? And I think I agree with you. I don't have any kids, but I, I believe a huge part of human civilization and being a homo sapien, that having kids as a human is a crucial part to life. And some may say that's the only reason why we're here is to reproduce and keep the species alive. So no, I, I definitely see that. And I think that's the big picture, whether you realize it on a conscious level or a subconscious level, that a lot of people want to learn languages. A lot of people want to learn languages to feel cool and to feel smart and inflate their ego for sure. Myself included. However, I think a big part is to understand other people and see how other cultures live and really connect and be a well-rounded human. And whether you realize it consciously or not, that is a huge part of the language learning community. And I, and I think it's a beautiful thing. Most diverse, one of the most diverse cultures and tribes that, uh, that exists now, especially online. So, and you're contributing to that. I think you're great. My last question for you which is a technical question. My last one is in it. your entire language learning experience, your process, your journey, what were the biggest mistakes that you made? And what would you tell Ollie 20 years ago? If you can go back in time, 20 years prior to today, what would you say? Hey, Ollie, I know you're motivated and you're going to have a really good life. You might not see it now, but this is how your life's going to be. When it comes to language learning, definitely don't do this because this is going to waste a lot of your time and definitely double down on this. I'm going to say it's going to be a personal take on, on, on the question. So for me, my biggest my single biggest regret relates to Japanese. So Japanese is the language that means the most to me. Um, like I said, I lived in Japan for three, three and a half years. <clears throat> I love it dearly, but it's not my strongest language by some, by some stretch. And <clears throat> the reason it's not my strongest language is because I didn't do enough to learn to read when I was there. 
I put it off, I put it off, I put it off, and I never really learned to read um, Chinese characters properly when I was in Japan. And um, Chinese characters, for anyone who's not sure, are what you call the Japanese kanji. Um, so it's part of the Japanese alphabet because they originally came from China. Um, I didn't learn to, to read them, which meant that I never learned to read Japanese while I was there, which meant that I wasted year, like pretty much the whole time that I was in Japan. I look back on that now, I'd say to myself, man, put in the time at the beginning, learn to read, and you would have made so much more out of your mm. out of your stay because you would have been able to read so much more, engage with the culture so much more. You, By reading, you would have learned so much more of the language. So in my particular case, it was learn to read from the beginning so that you can read as much as possible. And if I'd just done that, I would have, I would have, really made so much more out of what was a, one of the most special times of my life. And what would you double down on? Reading. Reading, reading, go. reading, 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 reading. And so it's just that in that case, what I needed to do in order to read was learn those, learn, learn those, learn mm. the script, right? Learn the Chinese characters. Once I'd done that, I would have spent so much more of my time reading. What about music and singing? Have you incorporated that into your process at all? Listening to it's Spanish not, I, music I, or listening to German I music? I don't. I don't teach it, um, but I do do it a lot. I listen to a lot of foreign music. Yeah. Do you think but it I, helps, I, I, or do you think it's too fast? Um, and a lot of well, a lot too, of slang too, right? There's a lot of yeah, slang but, but, depending on where the country's a, from. That could be a cool learning opportunity as well. Uh, I learned. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot of French rap back in the day when I was uh, <laughs> learning French. Um, so. I think that music can play a role, um, particularly to help endear you to the language. So, you know, we want, we all want to, we want to be doing things that we enjoy. And if you like music and if you like music in that language, then you should absolutely listen to music in that language because you're just going to have a better time. You're going to enjoy yourself more, mm -hmm. which means you're going to want to spend more time studying you're not going to learn a lot from music to be honest you'll learn a few words and phrases here or there but in the sense that it helps motivate you and just gives you more time with the language overall it's a net positive but maybe if you're using music as a language learning tactic you could use that at intermediate phase and that might actually help you a lot you can use it anywhere, man. I mean, I learned Brazilian Portuguese because um, I, I, I just discovered the world of uh, Bossa Nova and Samba. And I learned Brazilian Portuguese by sitting in my, my room with my guitar, learning to play like, olha que coisa mais linda, mais cheia de graça. Um, <laughs> these old Bossa Nova songs, I learned to play the chords on the guitar and sing the songs even though I didn't have the, the first clue what the um, the words meant. And I learned like 10, 20 songs in, in Portuguese. Um, and I just loved it. It was like I, I was having the best time. And then, and so later, you know, I made some Brazilian friends and they all found it hilarious that I could sing these Bossa Nova songs in Portuguese without knowing what they meant. But of course, that was the, that was my way in and that was the start. Mm. And, that, and it was that those relationships which then, just carried me forward for years after that and got you and helped me learn. So I kind of see it as, um, it's like what I said before, you can make anything work. Mm -hmm. You really can. So anything that makes, makes the whole process more enjoyable for you is, is going to be a win. Yeah, absolutely. And lowest barrier to entry. People can get in and have fun and they don't feel like they're going back to school and they're learning the language. And then you can implement the school, you know, uh, criteria afterwards but at least at that point you have enough knowledge you don't feel like you're wasting your time um, i think what you're doing is great i'm definitely going to sign up for your course uh, later today when we get off uh, i think your program is one of the best around for sure and if people want to get a hold of you they want to talk to you they want to buy your stuff they want to send you money what does that look like um don't send me money please um <laughs> but uh because my accountant will have a i'll have a I'll have a fit <laughs> people start doing that, but feel free to enroll in my courses. If you want to learn a new language, you can go to storylearning.com, um, storylearning.com for that. That's a central hub. And if you like YouTube, go over to YouTube, search for Ollie Richards, and you can sign up to 
to uh, subscribe to my channel there. I try to put out a lot of kind of entertaining, informative stuff about um, yeah. about languages, like for example, how the U.S. military trains people to learn. Oh, I, I watched that one. It was amazing, by the way. I watch. Cool. I actually watch all your videos in secret. I don't want to tell you until the end. <laughs> I actually watch all your nice. videos, and your videos are by far one of my favorites. So out of all the polyglots that are teaching this, your stuff is one of the best for sure. I definitely oh, recommend it. Well, thank people. you, man. I, I appreciate that. And not only is your stuff good, like good videos, like good content, but it's also good lessons to learn from a different angle and a different view, which is like how the military learns languages and foreign affairs and all this stuff, which is awesome. So you're keeping the person entertained. So you're like maximizing like Mr. Beast level YouTube uh, engagement, but you're also teaching people as well, not just pure content, pure entertainment, where this is just like mindless humor. I think what you do is a very sophisticated way of incorporating learning, but also making it fun, which is ideally uh, any way that you're going to learn or become a meta learner, like they say, or, or like my tri the caviar tribe says, the meta learner community. Um, your way is definitely the beneficial. It's fun, but also you're making progress as well. So you don't feel like you're wasting your whole time. Um, cool, man. Well, I had a blast uh, talking to you. I could talk to you for hours. Yeah, me too. Thanks so and, much. Uh, and I think you're great. Uh, go to Ollie Richards uh, YouTube channel watch his stuff buy his courses buy his books oh, oh are the books where are the books available on Amazon or Barnes and Nobles what does that look like they're everywhere man they're in your local Barnes and Noble store um, they're on Amazon you can just go and search for Ollie Richards uh, and they're, put they're in, the in Barnes and Nobles yeah the they're States? all they're, so B Benny Lewis told me that um, he once did a road trip through Georgia I think it was and he stopped at like 12 barnes and nobles and he saw my books in every single one of the barnes and noble stores that he that he stopped at across across georgia boom so i'm like, going uh, today so i'm going today they're, they're, so but if you want to find them on amazon you can go to like so type in like ollie richard spanish or ollie richard's uh japanese or whatever and it will it'll, it'll come up if they go to barnes and nobles and buy your book how do they get the audiobook? They just have to buy that on Amazon or on your website. There's a link. Yeah, there's there's a there's um inside what I recommend you do, buy the book first and then there's a 50% off code for the audio inside the book. Um so you got can you. listen along. Perfect. All right. All and right, guys. You well, book, you heard it. Post post a picture on Instagram and tag me and I'll uh I'll, I'll love you for that. Ali will love you for that. And so will I, because we love Ali Richards over here at Justin Caviar Show. You heard it here, folks, from Ali Richards. To Justin Caviar, this is the Justin Caviar Show, and we're out. Bye-bye, y'all.